Um, Abner, I, um, I really had no idea about such a project as the Legacy Standard Bible prior to January 1st, 2020, this year. Um, and yet, uh, by the goodness of God and your diligent effort, uh, we will accomplish the entire translation within one year, actually in, what, nine or 10 months. Yeah, that's right. It's a pretty amazing thing. Translations can take um, years, mm -hmm. multiple years. Um, there was a sense of urgency in my mind because the trends in translation were moving toward the reader and away from the author. Mm -hmm. And uh, the trend was always to shift and change the vernacular to catch up with uh, colloquial expressions and different word uses and all of that. And that is a frightening thing to me because it just moves you further and further away from the original intent of Scripture. To, to translate it is one thing. To adapt it is, um, is alien to the pure exercise of translation. So when I saw that trend, I became concerned. And after, well, since I left seminary half a century or more ago, the NAS has been my go-to translation, and it has stood the test of 50 years of, of exposition of Scripture, and, and it's never gone wanting. I, I, I have loved it. I've trusted it through all these years and testing it against, you know, all that study for those years. Um, and I started some wheels moving to see if we could get a hold of the NAS 95 and keep it where it is and make it better, and that's what we've endeavored to do. Um, at the time, I, I wasn't sure what the team would look like, but I did know that you could lead the team, you could give direction to it, and that we had scholars at the Master's University and the Master's Seminary who were skilled in the Greek and Hebrew and could do the work of translation. Um, so tell me how, initially when I proposed this to you, how, how did you think about doing it and you obviously were comfortable with the guys we had available. Yeah, how absolutely. Did it, how did you assemble them, and uh, how did that begin to take shape? Yeah, when when you approached me about this project, I, I was so honored because obviously um, the Word of God is central to everything we are as believers. And so to be able to steward that to generations to come is a sacred trust and none of us take it lightly. And I knew we needed a team. We needed a team that was dedicated and proficient in the biblical languages, committed to not just taking um, the Bible in sections and each person having their own section, but to doing it together. We needed a team that was like-minded in that way. And I started thinking through kind of the roster list of people at the Master's University and Seminary because we're familiar with them and the the task was entrusted to us. And I knew instantly that we could find the right kinds of people, people who knew Old Testament languages, New Testament language very, very well, who had the ability to have creative solutions to very tricky problems that come up in translation. And these are people, some of them who trained me, like Dr. Varner, one of our team mm -hmm. members. These are people I went to school with, like the Zakevich brothers. These are people that I've taught with, like uh, Professor Jason Beals or Paul Twist, who was also one of my students and now a colleague, and working with them in all these different ways and being engaged in iron sharpening iron with them in all kinds of ways in academics and such, I knew that this could be the right team. This would be the right team for the job, that we could get it it done not only relative to going through meticulously, word by word, phrase by phrase, thought by thought, everything, but that we would also get through it because we were under a time crunch and they're diligent, we're like-minded, we know how to approach and talk with each other and to come together to synthesize exactly what needed to be done every single time in so many decisions that we needed to make. So we had the resources available and the Lord just put us all together. Uh, if you think about all their backgrounds, all, just all the different people on the team, where they're from, this is an international team, from the UK to former Soviet Union. We're all brought together by the Lord's hand. 
And that is an amazing work of providence. So do you think the Lord allowed uh, COVID just so you guys would have more time <laughs> to translate? But that has made a contribution. It, it really has. And I don't want to belittle or lessen people's trials during this period of time because we know pastorally what our people are going through. And we pray for them and we care about them. But at the same time, we do see the Lord's providence that when things were shut down, it provided us an exceptional kind of time that we could dedicate to working on this in a way that we could never work on it otherwise. So it is true to say that you probably wouldn't have been able to do this in one year no. if it hadn't been a COVID year. Absolutely, and that's absolutely true, and that's God's providence. And, and what I kind of remind myself is Luther, when he produced the German Bible, there was a pestilence going throughout Europe. Is that right? In Germany. And so what did he do with his quarantine? He did a translation. And what did we do during ours? We did one too. Yeah, well, that is incredible. And um, the fact that you, you made a comment about you didn't pass out various parts of the scripture to different translators. All six men worked on every passage, That's every right. verse, which right. brought all their formidable skills together. Um, there are a couple of things that we talked about at the very beginning. That the one thing that I have been concerned about for quite a while is the, the translation or failure to translate doulos in the New Testament by the word slave, which is clearly what it means. There are several words for servant. Mm -hmm. Doulos is a word for slave, someone who's owned. Um, so that, that was an issue to me to get into the New Testament. I've, I've commented on that, preached on that, and wrote right. a book called Slave, trying to deal with that. One of the serious oversights I feel in English translation was the, the lack of the use of doulos to mean slave for cultural reasons that are not legitimate. Then you countered that with a desire in the Old Testament to use Yahweh, the name of God. Why, why is that important in the Old Testament? That is the name that God gave to his people. That's his personal name. And we see it in people's names. We know how to pronounce it from that. We can, we can reconstruct um, the pronunciation, the articulation of it based upon a lot of different factors, both in the Old Testament. So how would you language. say it so everybody knows what to say when they read it? Yeah, Yahweh is Yahweh. fine. And, and, and but it's really, a, it's yeah. from a verb. Yeah, it's from the verb to be. Right. And I think we should also be comforted if people think, oh, well, maybe, maybe I don't, maybe that's not the way God originally said it or something like that. Well, remember that with all names in scripture, all names, including God's own name, it is transferred over into from Hebrew to Greek. And sometimes the translation of that from Hebrew to Greek, it, it shifts the letters just a little bit. It, it's pronounced a little bit different between testaments. And the Bible doesn't get out of shape about that. Jesus, mm -hmm. we say the name Jesus, but in the Old Testament, it's Joshua. No one gets bent out of shape because there is a different enunciation or pronunciation of that name. We understand, and we understand that that brings honor to him. And God gave us his name, and we should know that he is a personal God. He and that's relates reflected to his people. in the fact that he gave us, we might say, his proper name. That's right, that's right. And so seeing that accentuates that we have a covenant relationship with him, a real relationship with him seeing that distinguishes him from all other so-called named deities. Mm. He's not Baal, he's not Allah, he's not Kimosh, he's not any of these false gods. He is Yahweh, the one true God, the only God that there is. That's his name, that's what distinguishes him from everything else and everyone else. And we should know him by that name to make sure that everyone knows it's that God not any other so-called God. And that also speaks to his aseity yes. or his self-existence yes. because his name is the verb to be. Yes. Um, that will be a little different when people read. Um, if they have uh, another English translation today, how do translators normally handle Yahweh? They usually the put it in all caps, L-O-R-D. So they do the same with Adonai, that's and right. Yahweh. So you don't know the difference except an uppercase Lord That's is right. reflecting Yahweh. That's How much right. clearer than to use his covenant name. Yeah. Does that enrich certain texts in the Old Testament? 
when you know he's using his covenant name? Yeah, because sometimes he says, this is my covenant name. And then the, te- the English translations might not put the covenant name, which gets confusing. Or sometimes when Adonai is used with Yahweh, it's translated as Lord God. So now we're starting to change a lot of things over because you can't translate a Lord, Lord, Lord. Lord that doesn't make a lot of sense. So you have to shift. And so now you're changing more than one word in, in the process. And I think what another benefit is, is that it's not just that we learned Yahweh better and we know God personally. And he knows us by name and now we know him by name. But it's equally that it sharpens all the other terms of scripture for God. That when it's talking about Lord, it really means his lordship, Mm -hmm. that he's our master. That's why he'll be called Lord Yahweh, because he's our king. He's King Yahweh, not just King Lord or Lord King or something of that nature. He is the king. He is the Lord in the proper sense, not just as a title or a name, but actually his position over us. So using Yahweh not only helps us to know what Yahweh means, it sharpens every other title for God as well. Yeah, and and I think it's such a clear and singular identity. There are a lot of people who would be Lord, and there are a lot of deities that would claim to be Lord, Mm -hmm. but only one is Yahweh. Yes. Uh, This is singularly God's name. Um, Some other things that you've done um, having to do with um, weights and measures and currency. Uh, You know, we we hear about um, certain amounts of currency. We're not familiar with those things. How how do you deal with those in the text? Well, fundamentally, because we're trying to go back to the original. We're trying to bring people not to what is today, but what the authors originally meant, what they said. This is a translation around the authors of Scripture, the writers of Scripture, and not the readers of Scripture. And so we wanted to bring them back to the measurements that they used. And that does require some explanation because they're not the same units of measurement and the same currencies that we have today. But that explanation is worth it. It's it's worth it. Um, One example that just comes off the top of my head is in Revelation, the dimensions of the New Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. Well, the numbers there of 12,000 and such, they are significant. The number itself is significant. And if you convert it to modern day units, you would lose the significance of the number itself, which has a value. Yes, it does refer to a certain length, about the length of the United States, I think some people say. But at the same time, the reason they chose to articulate it that way was because it had theological significance too at the same time. And so understanding what was originally written has theological purpose. It reminds us it's not about us. It's about going back to what the authors originally meant, has theological significance on top of that. And even more, on a very practical note, when you have to choose uh, what to convert it to all the time, you're going to have to make a choice between metric units or English units or which country's units. And this way, we say everyone has to go back to the original. And we put a footnote explaining, hey, if if you use the metric system, it's about this much. If you use the English system or the American system, it's this much. And it allows then the translation to reach a global scale. Yeah, and I think, uh, you know, with um, capacities like a bushel or whatever, those are easy to understand. Uh, Monetary terms are very hard to understand because you, you have to realize that in the intervening millennia, values are completely different. So once in a while, you'll see a Bible that will say, in modern terms, that's this amount, or in modern terms, this is another amount. But I think just sticking with the original and letting somebody find out that yeah. on their own is part of the exercise. Yeah, and what happens if there's inflation or something like that? Sure. And it's all going to change. Um, another question that uh, maybe would be interesting, regarding the first chapter of Colossians, there's an interesting style of prose from the original language that appears there. Maybe you could explain that. Yeah, so what we have in Colossians 1 is a structure that we see throughout Scripture, but it's very pronounced. It's very pronounced in Colossians 1, and that's a chiasm. A chiasm is where the first line parallels the last line, the second line parallels the second to last line, and then what's at the in the middle is the most important. The way I kind of describe it to my students is, it's kind of like a sandwich, two pieces of bread on the outside, and you always name a sandwich by what's on the inside. You never say, I want a wheat bread sandwich or something like that. It doesn't mm-hmm. make a lot of sense. 
And what we have in Colossians 1, verses 15 and following, is a chiasm, where it begins by saying, he is the image of the invisible God, because in him everything was created. And the last line of this poem says, who is the first, because in him all things subsist. And you have these nice parallelisms, and in the center of it, what is most emphasized is this reality in, say, uh, verse 17 or so, and it says, and he is before all things, and in him all things exist, and he is before all things. And that's in the center, because that's accentuating Christ. And what you have is this nice breakdown where the first half of the chiasm is about how Christ is the creator. Everything that was is in him. And then the second half is how he's head over new creation, the church. And so he's head of old creation, he's head of new creation, no wonder he's first over everything. Mm -hmm. And what we wanted to do was to bring that out so that the reader could see it. And so we did some things in the coding and such so that you can actually see each section and how it all So parallels. you broke it out in a format. That's right. Mm, that's really helpful. That We talked about that before, but God is the most nuanced communicator there is and has at his disposal the infinite genius yeah. <laughs> to make things um, rich that can be hidden below the surface unless the translators help us with that. Yeah, and we're just bringing out what's already there. Right there. That's right, yeah. and, and that's what we want people to see, and right. that just testifies to their Savior. Do you recognize where poetry occurs and uh, break that out? Yeah, yeah, so whenever there's poetic discourse in the scriptures, whether that be in certain passages of the New Testament or Psalms, Proverbs, and the prophets of the Old Testament, wisdom literature, we, we do break that into poetry. But in Colossians, oftentimes it's just continued as prose, but we said, hey, this is so important. This is mm -hmm. so valuable for people to see. Let's help them out, and we'll break it out into poetry right there, as it was always intended to be. Yeah, that's... that's, that's um an amazing little insight into the infinite beauty of God's mind. Yeah. I, I, we talk about a lot of things concerning God. We don't often talk about the incredible symmetry, mm. but bringing that out in a place like that shows the, the ordered systematic symmetry of the mind of God, mm -hmm. which is I think why those of us who know and love him are drawn toward order, not chaos, yeah. because yeah. it's reflective of him. Uh, whereas we look at the world around us, uh, doesn't know him, and chaos everywhere. So even in the delicate ways that God has laid out his word, you can see his character there. Um, maybe I could uh, just give a personal word of testimony. I've uh, been involved in a lot of projects in my life, and. They have all been an effort to explain the scripture mm -hmm. with two exceptions. One was One Perfect Life, mm -hmm. which was basically a harmony of the gospels where the gospels are blended into one narrative and the other was One Faithful Life, in which the story of Paul from the book of Acts and the epistles was blended into one life. And uh, I, I've often told people those are the, my two favorite books because I didn't write them. They're just, they're just treatments of scripture. But um, thinking about all the books explaining scripture, uh, I, I just could never have imagined the Lord would allow me to, to uh, see the opportunity for the men that I work with and love and trust to be able to actually go back to the original and do an a translation that will last. And my prayer for this translation is it will outlive all the people chasing fads and chasing the vernacular and trying to stay up to date. And that um, many years from now, after I'm long gone, um, this will be the go-to book for those who are faithful expositors. And I think about the Bible for the reader, of course, and want accuracy at that level. But I think more often I think about the Bible for the preacher because that's what I do. And um, I want to have in the hands of the preacher the purest possible tool that he can use and expound. And um, I'm convinced that this is gonna be it. So 
my thanks. Oh, well, praise God. And we're, we're thankful for all that he's allowed us to do and providentially raising you up and raising ministries up that have even trained a lot of us on the team and provided us this opportunity. All the glory goes to the Lord. Amen, it does. And, and yet the Lord has brought us all together yeah. for this project. Yeah. How wonderful is that?